Good evening. Uh, I'm Tim O'Shea. I'm the principal of the university, and it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome you uh, most warmly to the university and to this historic hall for the fifth in the University of Edinburgh Enlightenment Lecture Series, uh, which has been sponsored by Scottish Power. The aim of the series is to consider the nature of the Enlightenment in our own age and how Enlightenment, as an ongoing process of social and cultural development, continues to shape the times in which we live. The series began last year. We've had some very good talks, and recently the speakers have included the Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz and Jose Manuel Barroso, the president of the European Union. This evening we have the honor and the pleasure of hearing from one of the most renowned and respected philosophers of our times. Professor Daniel Dennett holds the Austin B. Professorship of Philosophy at Tufts University and is co-director of its Center for Cognitive Studies. He is a graduate in philosophy from Harvard University and also of the University of Oxford where he obtained his doctorate. I'm delighted to say that Professor Dennett, uh, like our new Prime Minister, is an on now an honorary graduate of this university having received his honorary Doctor of Letters at this afternoon's graduation ceremony in the McEwen Hall. The university is very pleased that we've been able to recognize Professor Dennett's achievements in this way, and we welcome him to that group of distinguished and, and, and worthy individuals. He's an expert on the philosophy of mind, science, and evolutionary biology. Through his research, he addresses some of the most basic intellectual concerns of educated people, such as the nature of consciousness and the possibility of free will. And he does so in an accessible way, encouraging debate and open discussion through widely read works such as Consciousness Explained, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Freedom Evolves, Kinds of Minds, and The Intentional Stance. He challenges us and engages us by reason and argument aimed at non-philosophers. That all sounds very serious, so you'll be pleased to know that he was responsible for the introduction of the first Frisbee to the United Kingdom uh, <laughs> while he was a student at Oxford, uh, engaged in dialogue with the Whammo company and brought a number more Frisbees, but never managed to set up a proper distribution network. Um, I'm not in any doubt about Dan Dennett's ability to engage us and make us think. Um, during my career, I've had the privilege of being with him in various seminars, and in March last year, he visited the university as guest speaker for our Nature of Knowledge lecture series. That lecture, like this one, was a sellout event and was very enjoyable and thought-provoking. I'm sure this evening will be just as good. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to invite Professor Dan Dennett to address us on the subject, is science showing that we don't have free will? Thank you very much. I am delighted to be here. It's a great honor to be in the land of David Hume, my favorite philosopher, and uh, to be able to speak to you on a topic that I think uh, Hume would much uh, appreciate. I think this microphone is a little hot. Uh, uh, does it, is that better? No, no a little bit? Uh, I guess we'll proceed as, as we go. Um, I don't know if Dilbert has reached this country. Uh, he has. Oh, good. Uh, I, I, this, is, this is one of my favorite Dilbert strips. Do you think the chemistry of the brain controls what people do? Of course. Then how can we blame people for their actions? Because people have free will to do as they choose. Are you saying that free will is not part of the brain? Of course it is but it's the part of the brain that's out there just being kind of free. So you're saying the free will part of the brain is exempt from the natural laws of physics? Obviously, otherwise we couldn't blame people for anything they do. Do you think the free will part of the brain is attached or does it just float nearby? <laughs> Shut up. Okay, there, is it. there it is. That is the classic problem of free will, the embarrassment of free will, right there. Uh, you can't do a better job of introducing the topic, I think, than that. So now I'm, what are we going to do with that? Well, 
Very recently, uh, in the august philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, uh, two psychologists, uh, uh, Josh Green and Jonathan Cohen, uh, uh, published a paper which has had a lot of attention. It's called, For the Law, Neuroscience Changes Nothing and Everything. Oh, this is a very interesting article uh, because it's very much a philosophical article, but it was written by psychologists. I'm pleased to see psychologists paying this much attention to philosophy. And I think they do a pretty good job, although I think one of the things they do a good job with is uh, articulating a very familiar view that is in fact mistaken, but thanks to their articulation of it, we can get clearer about it. It's always, it gives you something good to fix. So that's, in a way, what I'm going to try to do is to take some of the, of the points they raise, which are very provocative, and then show what we can do with them, how we can adjust them and, and fix them. Um, here's what they, here, this is from their abstract. Uh, new neuroscience will change the law not by undermining its current assumptions, but by transforming people's moral intuitions about freedom and responsibility. That's their claim. Here's what they say. Free will, as we ordinarily understand it, is an illusion generated by our cognitive structure. Retributivist notions of criminal responsibility ultimately depend on this illusion, and if we are lucky, they will give way to consequentialist ones, thus radically transforming our approach to criminal justice. Now this passage I'm going to come back to several times. If you didn't get it all the first time, I'm going to go back over it because we have to sort of take this apart. Uh, let's start with uh, retributivist and consequentialist, a little bit of uh, philosophical jargon. So what, what are these views? Well, retributivism, and I'm using their characterization of it, not because I think it's exactly right but because I think it exactly captures the standard semi-correct understanding of what retributivism is. As they say, it's backward looking. It's in the sense of looking backward in time to the agent who performed the deed that is possibly to be punished. Uh, it's focused on retribution, that's hence the name. It depends on the notion of desert, which requires that the culprit could have done otherwise. If the culprit could not have done otherwise, then the culprit doesn't deserve punishment, and so punishment depends upon this notion of could have done otherwise. That's retributivism. Consequentialism, as they say, is forward-looking. It's looking to the consequences of punishment. It's focused on deterrence, which they say does not depend on the could have done otherwise principle. And now you may recall that what they said is that if we are lucky, retributivism will give way to consequentialist thinking, thus radically transforming our approach to criminal justice. Well, that might shiver a few timbers because the radical transformation of our approach to criminal justice that it at least hints at, a consequentialist one, one which does not look backwards and does not depend on desert is not necessarily a pleasant view indeed, and many of you, no doubt, would find it a little bit disheartening. Uh, here's what they say, though, putting a positive spin on it. At this time, the law deals firmly but mercifully with individuals whose behavior is ultimately beyond their control. Someday, the law may treat all criminals this way, that is, humanely. That is, the suggestion seems to be that new neuroscience will show that maybe nobody ever is able to behave in ways that are within their control, and so we should stop punishing people and we should start treating them humanely. Well, you mean like the clockwork orange? That wasn't punishment, that was treatment. How about the book The Crime of Punishment by Carl Menninger? I think one of the more... Um, oppressive and ominous proposals uh, ever to come along. Or we can think of Skinner and Walden too, and the more later book Beyond Freedom and Dignity. The idea, no, we won't punish people. We will just condition them to behave in more social ways in the future. That's not punishment. Uh, if the suggestion coming from Green and Cohen is that we should move towards a treatment model of punishment, then some of us, I think, want to put on the brakes and say, hang on, 
I'm not so sure this is humane after all. But if they're right, and if the only options are retributivism or consequentialism, if they're right in their characterization of those two options, and if those options are exhaustive, then it looks like we're thrown back on a retributivism which has to make sense of could have done otherwise. Let's see what happens. Back to our key statement, free will as we ordinarily understand it is an illusion generated by our cognitive structure as we ordinarily understand it. Well, maybe we don't understand it correctly. Let's take this part of it apart. And maybe what we're going to find out is that as we ordinarily understand it, it may be an illusion generated by our cognitive structure, but if we improve our understanding of the ordinary concept of free will, we may be able to split the difference between retributivist and consequentialist notions of punishment, and thus, not radically, but gently and humanely, transform our approach to criminal justice. So, what I want to do here is actually something I think that is constructive. First of all, I want to say as a philosopher that I entirely agree with Cohen and Green that these are empirical matters, that neuroscience does have a bearing on how and why we should punish. And I also agree that it's entirely possible that new work in neuroscience will, as they say, transform and even radically transform our attitudes towards our approach to criminal justice. But the question is whether it ought to. Maybe it will be a misunderstanding of the new work in neuroscience that leads us to make a transformation of our uh, approach to criminal justice that, that isn't in fact as well grounded as possible. So while I agree with them that we should look hard at, at the neurosciences, and at empirical advances there. And I'm quite ready to accept as a, as a genuine possibility that what we learn may lead us to transform our whole notion of criminal responsibility and punishment. I'm not so sure that they've put their finger on what the transformation is going to be or why. So I want to look more closely at our ordinary notion of free will and how we might better understand it. And I'm happy to turn to Hume, my favorite philosopher, and remind you of Hume's definition of liberty or free will. By liberty, then, we can only mean a power of acting or not acting according to the determinations of the will. That is, if we choose to remain at rest, we may. If we choose to move, we also may. That is the kernel of Hume's account of free will. And it says nothing about chance or indeterminacy, and moreover, it even uses the word determinations of the will, and it draws attention to something which I think many philosophers ought to be puzzled by. Many philosophers are deeply worried about the implications of determinism for free will, while forgetting that one of the the things we often say in praise of an agent is, she shows such determination. Determination in that context seems to be a term of, of praise. Uh, 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 this is a good thing if you show determination, not a bad thing. Well, let's see what we can make of this. Here's a common belief that determinism is incompatible with free will. Oh, this, to some people, I've discovered this is, they just think this is definitional. If determinism is true, then we don't have free will. It's as simple as that. They think that unless there is something like quantum indeterminacy in our brains, we cannot have free will. Whew. It's all right, though, because the physicists say that quantum physics is indeterministic, so, ha, ah, we're off the hook. We can, we can somehow harness the indeterminism of quantum physics, and that's going to, that's going to save us so that, so that we can punish people, as Gilbert says, <laughs> with, a, with a clear conscience. 
We can always punish them. The question is whether, whether we can justifiably punish them. This, I want to argue, is a mistake. Now, that's a, that's a bold, ambitious, outrageous claim in a way. Just say that is a mistake. For thousands of years, 2,000 years and more, philosophers have thought this wasn't a mistake, or at least many have. And there's others who have been just as sure that it is a mistake. I am of that latter camp, and I'm going to try to show you why this is a mistake. Why determinism is not incompatible with free will, why compatibilism, if we must have isms, is true. And I'm going to do it by an indirect route, by reminding you of some words that don't exist in English, or that do but are never used. Couth. Uh, you are all extremely couth today, I must say. Um, uh, also, sheveled. Uh, I've seldom seen such a sheveled bunch of dressers. Uh, I am made by your presence, in fact. And not at all plussed. <laughs> oh, I am plussed. I am not non-plussed, but plussed. What these words are, are words which are never used in their positive, but only in their negative sense. And I draw your attention to this curious use of, uh, curious set, class of words, because I want you to marvel at a word that we don't use in English that we might, and that's evitable. Things are evitable or inevitable. We often talk about the inevitable. We seldom talk about things that are evitable. I used to say, it's never used. I found it for the first time ever in a book the other day, and I almost cheered. <laughs> the book, by the way, is a, uh, just as an aside, is a book called The Omnivore's Dilemma. And it is an outstanding book. I highly recommend it to you all. It is a book that uh, uh, you will learn a great deal about the world food system and what's wrong with it and how we might make it right. So I highly recommend that book. And among its many virtues are that it uses the word evitable. <laughs> and I want to talk about the evolution of evitability. Because that's the key to understanding free will. It's interesting, by the way, that, say, French and Italian have the word evitable, evitabile, and they use it all the time. We have avoidable, but it's not a sort of frequently used word. So let's think about evitability. Here's something which many people would subscribe to. If the world is deterministic, then everything in my future is inevitable. This is false. Actually, it's worse than that. It's too confused to be false. Isn't that strange? I mean, it's quite a familiar saying or, or an idea. It's one that one often encounters as a sort of opening remark in a discussion about free will and, and the problem of determinism. And I'm saying that not only is it not obviously true, it is too confused even to be false. Let's see why. To see why, let's go back to another uh, great Enlightenment figure, Pierre Laplace, who gives us our standard and I think still very usable idea of what determinism is. Imagine, I'm speaking anachronistically now, we didn't have the camera for making snapshots. Imagine that we had a complete description of the universe at an instant, a snapshot, if you like, of the whole universe. That is a description of the position, trajectory, and mass, and uh, velocity of every particle in the universe at one moment. This is what he says. And then what he goes on to say about this is, well, if you've got one moment and you know the laws of interaction, you can, you can predict exactly what the next moment is by just seeing which particles are going to collide and where they're going to bounce. It is the extrapolation, the enlargement of, of something that we do actually all know. And that is, if you think of the sort of two-dimensional version, the, uh, the balls on a snooker table. And if you 
know the angle of incidence and the, and the speed and the, the mass of the balls, you can actually do quite a very good job of predicting where the balls will go next, which collisions will happen, and where all the balls will end up at rest. That's our sort of model of determinism applied now to every particle in the universe. Here's what Laplace has to say about that. This is, this is the sort of canonical description of determinism. An intellect which at any given moment knew all the forces that animate nature and the mutual positions of the beings that comprise it. If this intellect were vast enough to submit its data to analysis, how modern that sounds, could condense into a single formula the movement of the greatest bodies of the universe and that of the lightest atom. For such an intellect, nothing could be uncertain and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. So there is the definition of determinism. Now, what's the problem with free will? Well, let's do this bit by bit. Hands up those of you who agree with this formula. In deterministic universes, everything that happens is determined. That's just true by definition. That's a tautology. It's trivially true. Now, I'm just going to change one word in it. In deterministic universes, everything that happens is inevitable. Now, yes, I didn't ask for a show of hands, but there's somebody who thinks that's true too. What I want to do is show you that this is not obvious. The first statement is a tautology. It is true, and in fact it is vacuously true. I want to know what does the second statement add that makes it interesting, since the first one isn't interesting, or important, since the first one is a tautology. Is it even true? And I want to say, no, it isn't true. It isn't true. How could that be? Ask yourself, what does it mean if it doesn't mean what the first means? It's this substitution of the word inevitable for the word determined, which I think is the source of the error. And I'm challenging that substitution. The first statement there in yellow, that's true. How could it be false? The second statement is much more problematic, and I'm going to suggest it's just plain false. Now, here's a Another definition of determinism, and I'm going to accept it, and it presents a very interesting challenge. This is by the American philosopher Peter Van Inwagen. Determinism, he says, is the thesis that there is at any instant exactly one physically possible future. Now, you can see how that fits perfectly with Laplace. You have that instantaneous snapshot of the universe. There's our instant, and Laplace says, the determinism says that you can predict to a, to a certainty the next instant because there is just one possible way that all of those parts can interact next. And that's a nice way, too, of bringing out what the, what the quantum physicist says. When the quantum physicist says, no, at any instant there are many possible futures and they are completely undetermined, that's the randomness of quantum physics. To say that where those electrons are, is not determined, there are more than one possibility. So we have a clear sense of what quantum indeterminism is. Van Inwagen says there is exactly one physically possible future. Now this raises a really interesting question. In a deterministic world, are there any real options? Real options. Well, at first it looks, no, no, there aren't. There's, that's the one thing there aren't. Or real opportunities. Hmm. Well, what's an opportunity? What is an opportunity? This is not an easy question to answer. If there is at any instant exactly one physically possible future, that's the thesis of determinism, then at no instant are there two or more possible futures which is just what an opportunity requires or seems to require. 
two or more possible futures. So it looks as if we have a proof of the thesis that if determinism is true, then there aren't any real opportunities, there aren't any real options, so we can't have free will. Because there's only one possible future at every instant. So is that, is this a good argument? I say no. Actually, I say no, it's not. It's very puzzling how this can be. I'm going to try to explain why I think this does not follow. Let's, again, I want to sort of build up to it by indirection. Here's something that people often say. You can't change the past, but you can change the future. Oh, really? From what to what? From what to what? The future is what's going to happen. You can't change that. If determinism is true, I can't change the future. Well, if determinism is false, you can't change the future either. <laughs> so you can't change the future. So that has nothing to do with determinism. It's just as true in an indeterministic world. The future is just what will happen, whether it's determined or not. You can't change that. The very idea of changing it is a mistake. Huh? What you can change is you can make something that was anticipated to be in the future not happen. We'll see. So you can't change the future. Now I want to show you that determinism does not imply inevitability. Well now, logically, how could I do that? Well, one way would be by showing you deterministic worlds, that is, I describe a world which is deterministic, in which there is evitability. In which, well, how would I do that? Well, in deterministic worlds, some kinds of things are inevitable, and some kinds of things are not inevitable. They're evitable. If I can show you that in deterministic worlds, some kinds of things are evitable, I will show you that determinism does not imply inevitability. And I'm going to give you a very simple example. This is my sort of parade case of evitability. I launch a brick at your head, you see it, and you duck, thereby avoiding a collision with the brick. How many of you think that this is possible? Yes. Of course, if it's not a brick, but a bullet in a gun, chances are you won't be able to duck in time. And that bullet will, your ability to avoid flying bullets is considerably less than your ability to avoid flying bricks. It seems that the bricks maybe are, the brick collisions are evitable while the bullet collisions, at least some of them maybe aren't. Now that's the basic idea I want to pursue. And I want to show how evitability, actually determinism improves evitability. When I throw that brick at you, the light bounces off the brick into your eyes, deterministically. In your eyes, a process begins in your brain which identifies the looming brick, quickly calculates its trajectory, triggers a reflex avoidance mechanism, and leads you to duck the brick. We could go into more detail if it was important. The main thing is there is a nice mechanical story of how the perception of the brick causes you to duck the brick, thereby avoiding the collision with the brick. Did you change the future? No. You changed what was gonna happen into something else, but it was, turns out it was never going to happen. Why? Because you were determined to see it coming and duck. But of course, maybe, maybe, maybe you're short of cash and are looking for a good lawsuit. <laughs> and you manage to, to stifle your brick ducking circuit and take the brick in the head reaching for your cell phone to call your lawyer. That's another possibility. 
And these possibilities are independent of whether determinism is true or not. So you can avoid avoiding. And you can avoid avoiding avoiding and so forth. That's something that we can do. The fact that we can do this is itself not just a random fact, but something that needs an explanation. How can we be such good avoiders? We've evolved to be good avoiders. That's the key. Inevitable means unavoidable. Unavoidable by what? Well, by an avoider. What's an avoider? An avoider is an agent of some sort. X avoids Y. And what is an agent? An agent, first of all, is finite and is designed in one of two senses. Either designed like a robot by some uh, agent designer, robot designer, or by natural selection. Natural selection first designed lots of agents and then made some agents that are now capable of designing other agents and other things. Some agents are evolved and others are artificial. Now, an agent is always at risk, more typically in competition for limited resources, for staying out of harm's way, for getting what it needs to hold life and limb together. Resources are limited, so it has needs. And its needs are served by its capacities to address those needs. And that capacity is primarily the capacity, as I like to say, to extract information from the past in order to anticipate the future better. Brains are for producing future. Not the future that will happen, but the future that will happen unless I do X. That is the key. The key is that our brains are evolved avoiders. Now, it's awkward that in English, and as far as I can, in the languages I know anything about, we, every language has, has a good verb for avoiding and for avoiding harm. And we don't have a single verb for its mirror image, which is, the, the, as it were, the obtaining of good. You seek the good and shun the bad. You avoid the bad and you what the good. Well, you try to obtain it, you get it, you gather it, you secure it, you catch it, you go for it. But there's no word which is just the opposite of avoid, at least if there is, I can't think of one. And so I will use, I will talk about evitability and inevitability when in a certain sense I could just as well talk about catchability or something like that. And note, but notice that if you do that, our, our, our anxious slogan just is really daft. You know, if determinism is, is true, then the future is uncatchable. Really? What on earth does that mean? It means, or, or that you can see that if, if, if that uncatchable, ungettable, if that doesn't make much sense, then the future is inevitable, should make no more sense. An agent being finite has incomplete information about the world it inhabits. That is its predicament, that is its problem. Uh, philosophers might say, it does not know exactly which world it is in of all the possible worlds. Where possible means the epistemically possible by its lights. So if you think of an agent with its incomplete information, it knows it is in one of a set of possible worlds which differ in all sorts of ways that it, it doesn't know enough about. It doesn't know exactly which world it is in. It knows it is in a world where the law of gravity holds. It knows it is in a world where uh, 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 London is the l largest city in Great Britain. Uh, uh, it doesn't know whether it is in a world in which um, the Red Sox won last night because it hasn't seen the paper today, uh, and so forth. Now, here's a, this was a, the cover of Science Magazine a few years ago. I love this slide. It's, it's, a, it's a little cartoon in a way. It's an artist 
rendition of a motor protein. And what it shows is a motor protein tramping along on its little tubulin highway in, in a cell. Now, a motor protein is it's a protein. It's not alive. It is just a large molecule. But it is the, the lorry of the cell. There are thousands and thousands of motor proteins running around in your cells right now. Trillions upon trillions of them, because you have uh, maybe 100 trillion cells, and each one of them has thousands of motor proteins in it. So there's a lot of these little robots running around inside you. They're not alive. They do not have free will. They are just robots, micro-robots, na nano-robots. Uh, I raise this because of my slogan, which I want to draw to your attention. I got this from an Italian interviewer, actually philosopher Giulio Girello, wonderful Italian philosopher, journalist. He interviewed me some years ago, well, 10 years ago. And I don't know if he's responsible for the, for the article's headline when it came out the next day, but I love it. Si, abbiamo un'anima, ma è fatta di tanti piccoli robot. Yes, we have a soul, but it's made of lots of tiny robots. <laughs> and that is my view. Yes, we have a soul. That is to say, we have the wherewithal for moral responsibility. We have, there is, the thing that we've got is what justifies our being praised and blamed. It's what gives us moral responsibility. It's what gives us free will. And it's made of lots of tiny robots. Motor proteins being the sort of smallest robots. But then the cells that they uh, enable, those are, each cell is a little robot. And you got trillions of those. And that doesn't have free will either. So what you're made of is, say, 100 trillion robots made of robots. And none of those have free will. But the material soul that's made of those does have free will. How can that be? The key lies in evolutionary biology, not in physics. The physics is the same for those robots and for trees and for volcanoes and for every non-living thing on the planet, doesn't matter whether it's deterministic or indeterministic. The difference between the things that have free will and the things that don't is a difference that only can be explained by evolutionary theory, not by physics. So philosophers have been looking at the wrong part of science for the last 2,000 years by looking at the physics. Because it's evolutionary biology that can explain how we can be free when our parts aren't free. The parts aren't free. They don't have free will. But the whole, the organization of the whole, has properties that the parts don't have. Now, this is not so alarming or strange when you think about how this is true, not just about freedom, about things that are red are made of parts that are not, in the end, red. Well, if something can be red when it's smallest parts aren't red, why can't something be free when its smallest parts aren't free? There are lots of properties that large ensembles can have that are not shared by their smaller parts. Now, in order to make this clear, I want to revert to one of my favorite, now perhaps some of my readers will say threadbare, overused examples, the chess playing computer. Um, how many of you do not play chess, do not know the rules of chess? No, you, nobody will admit it. Okay, see, it's very important to ask the right question. Uh, so I'm going to assume you all play chess. You don't have to be good, you just have to know roughly what the game is. Because I want to talk about the chess playing computer. So, How many of you have played chess against a chess playing computer? How many of you have been beaten by a chess playing computer? <laughs> good. That's the point I wanted to make. Uh, it's one point I wanted to make. I love this cartoon. This, 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, when Deep Blue beat Kasparov, and Kasparov was very upset. I love this. Sure, you can play chess, but come back when you can go into a snit. 
You see, the, the benchmark of human intelligence shifts. Chess is no longer an important test. But being able to go into a snit, that's, that's, that's where we really excel. Um, so it is, it's just 10 years ago that, that, that um, the world chess champion was beat fair and square by, by a computer. But I'm not going to talk about programs as fancy as that. I'm going to talk about everyday chess programs. It doesn't matter. And I want to point out to you that a, a chess program is a simple deterministic avoider. What does it avoid? It avoids checkmate. Now, a chess playing computer program is a checkmate avoiding program. It avoids, suppose we have two, in fact I want you to consider two different chess programs. There are dozens, but take any two you like. Call one A, call the other B. If you pit A against B, one of them will win, the other will lose. The one that wins will be a better, on that game, checkmate avoider than the other. This is all deterministic. The one that does this, let's call that A, does it by looking ahead, by producing future and evaluating that future. Chess is really a game of competitive future producing. How far ahead can you look? You share all the same information, unlike, say, Bridge or poker, most, most card games. Chess is a game of perfect information, that is to say there are no secrets. Each side has all the information that's relevant. It's which one can crank the most future out of the information that they both share and then act on that future. That's why chess makes a nice example here. So now, I want you to imagine something that we could do tonight very simple, there's nothing science fiction about this. We're going to make a deterministic competition. We're going to put two programs, A and B, in a tournament. Chess program A and chess program B, and we're going to have a program which is the tournament program T, and it's simply the, 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 the program that supervises the playing of successive games. So it's, it's the authority that simply and we're going to have a thousand games, A against B, in a thousand games. Okay? That's all one big program, and all perfectly deterministic. Now, what's going to happen? At this point, programs A and B are, are officially, they're just sort of subroutines in the larger program T. One big program, which has these subroutines that play chess against each other. The program T is deterministic. What does that mean? It means if you turn the computer off, turn it back on, reboot it, start up program T again, exactly the same thousand games of chess are going to come cranking out as came out the first time. You rewind the tape of life, you run it ahead. It's ex we, we can accomplish that. So that we, I want to make sure everybody understands there's no indeterminism involved in this at all. This, computers are wonderful examples of systems that are deterministic even if the world is indeterministic. They absorb the indeterminacies if there are any. They, in, in, uh, they absorb the, the chaotic fluctuations and they can give us genuinely deterministic phenomena in a world whether or not determinism is true or false. And I want, I, I want to worst case it here. I want to stick with a deterministic world so that we can look at avoiding in a deterministic world. Now, how would those histories come out? We can imagine it going several different ways. Stupid way number one is that A always beats B and they play the same game over and over and over again. They play the same game a thousand times. If you write the program that way, you don't learn a darn thing. You don't even learn that one is a better program than the other. All you learn is that A beats B in this particular game. So what you want to do, if you really want to get it, whether A or B is a better, is a better program, you want to make sure that, and it's easy enough to arrange, that 
they don't always get off the same foot and that they're pseudo-random number generators in a slightly different state, then they will play a thousand different games. Always the same thousand different games, but a thousand different games. It's only if you make sure that they play a thousand different games that you get any purchase on the interesting question of which one is a better program. Because it's better under many different circumstances. It's the variability in the conditions that's really important. We don't learn anything about causation if we play the same game a thousand times. Much more interesting is if A plays B and always beats B and they never play the same game twice. Then we know that A is really superior to B. It just always wins, but they're different games. Very interesting would be if A usually beats B and there's a pattern. So now we can, now we can begin to be scientists about this. We can say, ah, under what conditions can B win? What are, the, what are the weaknesses? Now we can begin to look and see Ah, A has some weaknesses too, or B has some strengths. We didn't imagine that. You can't do science with this unless you get some variability in the pattern like this. Now we can look for an explanation. And what we're looking for is an explanation of A's competence. We want to understand what that competence is. It can be judged and it can be analyzed and see how it differs from B's competence. Now this word competence is really important. I want to draw your attention to a famous quotation from the philosopher John Austin in his classic paper, Ifs and Cans. In philosophy, it is can that we seem so often to uncover, just when we had thought some problem settled, grinning residually up at us like the frog at the bottom of the beer mug. So we're looking now at Austin's grinning frog at the problem of can and what it means to say that A can do something that B cannot. There's J.L. Austin. If we look at the patterns to be found in the chess matches, first of all, let's just remind ourselves of both programs are going to always obey the rules of chess. They're programmed so that they always do that. They're both going to exhibit uh, following the basic strategies. We'll see that there's a near certainty of loss if one player, A or B, gets, more, uh, gets a, a rook or more behind. Uh, B maybe thinks it should get its queen out early. That's one of the things we discover about it. Um, and so that would be, a, we would have just discovered an interesting weakness in B's strategy. We note the role of time pressure and so forth. We could study this list of a thousand games with all of the uh, analytic tools that we would use to study any group of human games too. But now comes the crux. Somebody, one of you might now want to say, well, you know, there are no real forks in the future of this world. All the choices Choices made by A and B are determined for all time. Well, now there's a certain sense in which that is true. After all, if we run the same program again, exactly the same thousand games will come out and it looks as if all the choices are determined. That's what determinism means. It looks as if there's, if there's any suspense, it's phony. Thus, we come across game 712 and it looks as if A is going to win. And then A's clock runs out and B saves the day. Whew! Looks like there was some suspense, but if you've been there before, you think that's just phony suspense. It was always going to, it was, B was always going to win that game. There was no real suspense. A mating net looms over B. It was never going to happen, you can say, with the luxury of hindsight, because it didn't happen. Since it didn't happen, it was never going to happen. It only seemed like it was going to happen, and then it didn't happen because the other program uh, uh, ran out of time or whatever. So now, I hope you see that this setup I've given you, it's deterministic and yet we are at least tempted to use the language of choice and to talk about competence and good choices and bad choices and yet the question is whether that's legitimate. I want to suggest it is entirely legitimate because there are real-world phenomena that we can see right here that require an explanation and they need an explanation in terms of the difference in competence between A and B. And I want to illustrate this. I want to get this as close as I can in this toy world. Computer test programs don't have free will. I am not leading up to say that they have free will. They don't. 
But they have an element of free will. They have an element that is crucial, and we want to establish that element. Then we can look at fancier cases. So imagine we look through those thousand games, and we find two games out of that thousand where they start the same way for the first 12 moves. And in one of them, A is playing white, and the other one, uh, B is playing uh, uh, white, A is playing black. So we look at them, and for the first 12 moves, they're exactly the same. Okay. And then comes the crucial move, A playing white castles and goes on to win. B playing white doesn't castle and loses. So we've, we've located the crux. It was that castling at move 12. That was the key move. B's designer shrugs and says, eh, B could have castled. Is that true or false? If we look at it from the point of view of determinism, we say, oh, no, 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 that's not true. If we run that tape, if we run those games, we do it a th the thousand games, we run it 20 times, every time at that point, at a, that exact point, B will fail to castle. It is not true that B could have castled. B's designer says, that's not what I meant. What I meant was, and now she pulls out reams of, of printout and says, look, 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 here's the program. At this point, B is, clock is running low, B consults the clock, consults time every now and then. At this exact moment, B consults the random number generator and got a number seven, if, if, the, if got a number six, it would have considered for another fraction of a second, would have discovered castling and would have castled. Flip one bit on the random number generator and B castles. That's what I mean when I say that B could have castled. Just one bit in that whole program, you just flip that bit and B castles and goes on to win. That's what I mean by B could have castled. In particular, he says, or she says, on the basis of this game, I see nothing to improve. The, there's no flaw in the program that could be fixed. In that sense, B could have castled. Is it true or false that B could have castled? Well, B knows the rules. We might, as I just said, imagine that B actually considered castling briefly and then decided against it, didn't think about it quite long enough. That's the only difference. In that sense, B could have castled. But alternatively, perhaps castling was a deep move. And we could have a little argument, and the designer of A could say, no, A could have castled. You notice A did castle in the relevant situation. But, but B is just an inferior program. B was miles away in the search space from castling. B couldn't have castled. It was just much too deep a move for B. Now, this sort of difference we need to be able to describe. It is relevant to the question of competence, and it is orthogonal to it. It is not, has nothing to do with determinism. It has to do with the design competence of A and B, irregardless of, of, of the uh, issue of determinism. So it might be that A could have castled, but not B. Now we're talking about a deterministic program, T, and we're saying, Program A, subroutine A, has, it is true of subroutine A, it could have castled in this situation. B could not have, because it was a deep move, and A is a better program. It can get to those deep moves, B can't. Back to Austin, and a famous footnote. And this is Austin's putt. I love to talk about this, because this is a famous paper, and I think that in this footnote, Austin commits an egregious error. And I want to point it out, because he was a very careful philosopher, but sometimes he got it wrong. Here's what he says. Consider the case where I miss a very short putt and kick myself because I could have held it. It's not that I should have held it if I had tried. I did try and missed. It is not that I should have held it if conditions had been different. That might, of course, be so. But I am talking about conditions as they precisely were and asserting that I could have hold it. There's the rub. 
Nor does I can hold at this time mean that I shall hold at this time if I try or if anything else. For I may try and miss and yet not be convinced that I could not have done it. Indeed, further experiments may confirm my belief that I could have done it that time, although I did not. So I want to draw your attention then to those two phrases I italicized. In the first he says he's concerned with conditions as they precisely were. And then he goes on to say that further experiments may confirm his belief. Well, what kind of experiments do you suppose he had in mind? Experiments in the physics lab with quantum physics? I don't think so. So I want to consider two different experiments. So you imagine the scene where on the putting green, Austin misses the putt, misses the putt. He says, I could have hold it. His partner says, I don't think so, John. He says, further experiments will prove, will confirm that I could have hold it. Fair enough. What experiments? Ha, he says, watch this. He takes out a book of matches and he lights ten matches in a row and throws them down. He says, see? His partner says, what does that have to do with your putt? That's completely irrelevant to that putt that you took. I think you would all agree. So instead, then, he lines up pretty much the same putt and does it ten times and he gets nine out of ten. And his opponent says, his partner says, I don't see what that shows. That's just like striking the matches. You said conditions as they precisely were. And it's later in the day, the, the temperature is a tenth of a degree higher, the sun is in a different position, the grass is a little drier, you're a little more tired, you used a different ball. Some of these were a little bit longer, some of them a little bit shorter. If you're talking about conditions as they precisely were, then of course you'll never know. Because he wasn't talking about conditions as they precisely were. In spite of what he said, that's the mistake he made. If taking a bunch of putts is relevant, then it cannot be true that he was thinking about conditions as they precisely were. On the contrary, he was thinking about conditions in the neighborhood. He was varying things a little bit. It's only if you look at conditions as they, not as they precisely were, but in the neighborhood that you get any evidence about competence at all. If you play the same chess game hundred times in a row, you don't learn a thing about how good you are. It's only if you vary the conditions that you get anything about causation. That's why we care about causes. It's because we don't know exactly which world we're in, so we want things that'll work in whichever world we're in that's in the neighborhood. We care about the saliencies in the world on which we can base action. So we always care about what is true in all or most of a set of possible worlds that are all slightly different. It simply does not matter whether in exactly that position we would do A rather than B. What's interesting is whether in the neighborhood there are lots of other conditions where we would have done something else. That's where we discover our competence or our incompetence. The actual world is always hidden from us like a needle in a haystack. We can't know, remember our, we're finite agents, we, ha we can only know a cloud of possible worlds and we're in one of those and we want to know what's true in all or most of that cloud. That's what matters and determinism is simply irrelevant to that. Consider a man falling down an elevator shaft. He doesn't know exactly which world he's in but he knows he's in the set of possible worlds all of which have him landing at the bottom of the shaft. <laughs> Gravity makes that inevitable. That is inevitable. But his death may not be inevitable. It, it may be that in some of those worlds he may live if he can get into a, the right position for how to land. It's worth a try. <laughs> so now, some conclusions. We're never interested contra Austin in conditions as they precisely were because those would tell us nothing about causation and nothing about competence and competence is what we care about. It's only in the worlds of design things that there is meaningful avoidance. The meaning of inevitability is to be found in an evolutionary perspective that has nothing to do with physics. Freedom, the enlargement of can, is something that has evolved and is evolving. 
In fact, what I'd like to point out is that we have had an explosive evolution of evitability on this planet in recent times. All evitability depends on design, which is either evolved or the deliberate creation of evolved designers. There's much more evitability now than there was in 1814. There's lots of things that are avoidable now that weren't avoidable then. We can do things now that we couldn't do then. These are, these are obvious facts and they require for their explanation a notion of can, which is, as it were, determinism proof. Notice the physics hasn't changed. It has nothing to do with physics. So we've had an explosive growth of evitability. Now, wh when I raised this point in my 2003 book, uh, uh, Freedom Evolves, Galen Strassen called this a mere linguistic quibble. Well, let's see. I could learn to speak Italian fluently. I could not learn to fly by flapping my arms. Could I learn to play professional basketball? Not anymore. It's too late for that. <laughs> questions like these are the morally relevant questions to ask about can, and they have nothing to do with whether determinism is true or false. They do not concern conditions as they precisely were. We now can do things we could not do before. I can travel from Boston to Edinburgh in less than 24 hours. I can send color photographs from Edinburgh to Boston in a few seconds. These are things that Laplace couldn't do. These are things that J.L. Austin couldn't do. There's been a growth of can-do. There's been a growth of evitability and freedom. Well, thanks to evolution, what can be done on this planet has multiplied many times. Physics hasn't changed, as I say. Well, I'm going to run ahead. Take. How has this happened? It happens because of evolution. I'll just go back very briefly. There's just the tree of life. It doesn't look much like a tree. That's because you're looking at it from a bird's eye view looking down on it, and we see us um, in the, there's Coprinus homo and Zaya out on one branch. That's uh, um, mushrooms, us, and corn, close relatives on the tree of life. It takes a lot of R&D to create all those differences. We have free will. Mushrooms don't. Neither does corn. We have 3.5 billion years, roughly, to accomplish all of this. And, of course, many people wonder if there are wonders too wonderful to have been generated by natural selection. Are there any, any sky hooks? Well, I'd just like to point out how amazing some of the things we can do now. We have a, a, a genetically obese mouse on the left, and we have a, a tobacco plant that glows in the dark because it has firefly genes spliced into its genome. These are possible now. They weren't possible a few years ago. And they are legitimate objects on the tree of life. It's amazing what we can do today. 10,000 years ago, shortly after the dawn of agriculture, the human population plus livestock and pets was less than 1% of the terrestrial vertebrate land mass. That is, if you take all the animals and put them on the scale, not the fish, not the insects, not the worms, just all the animals Put them on the scale. Human beings, and plus their livestock pets, uh, and pets, would be a, less than 1% less than of the total. What do you suppose that percentage is today? 40? 90? 98. 98%. That's an explosion of evitability. I, it's Paul McCready who worked out that calculation. Here's what he says about it. It's such, so important. I want you to hear it. Over billions of years on a unique sphere, chance has painted a thin covering of life, complex, improbable, wonderful, and fragile. Suddenly, we humans, a recently arrived species no longer subject to the checks and balances inherent in nature, have grown in population, technology, and intelligence to a position of terrible power. We now wield the paintbrush. It's because of our competence that we have free will. Noblesse oblige. We're the ones that can do. That's why we are obliged, in a way no animal is obliged, to look ahead and think ahead and then take steps that are within our power. Now, here's my old nemesis, Jerry Fodor, friend and nemesis. And Jerry can always be counted on 
to say vividly and amusingly what I take to be false. If he didn't exist, I'd have to invent him. Here's what he has to say about free will. He does it in terms of what we want. One wants to be what tradition has it that Eve was when she bit the apple, perfectly free to do otherwise, so perfectly free, in fact, that even God couldn't tell which way she'd jump. That was his review of my book back in 2003. Why does one want that? Do you want that? I've tried to show you, you shouldn't want that. It's not, it's not needed. Of course, what one wants in this case is a miracle. But you can't have a miracle. So we want to go back and ask yourself why you want it. And I want to share a, a, a sort of talisman quote from this book, Net of Magic, which I highly recommend. It's a lovely book about Indian street magic. Um, and in it, Lee Siegel says, I'm writing a book on magic, I explain, and I'm asked, real magic? By real magic, people mean miracles, thaumaturgical acts, supernatural powers. No, I answer. Conjuring tricks, not real magic. Real magic, in other words, refers to the magic that's not real. <laughs> While the magic that is real, that can actually be done, is not real magic. <laughs> now, it is the truth. And uh, in my whole career, I realized that this has been my problem. I try to explain consciousness, and people say, well, that can't be consciousness, not real consciousness, because it isn't real magic. And consciousness has to be real magic or it isn't consciousness at all. And the same thing is true of free will. As Jerry Fodor points out, some people, their definition of free will, if it isn't real magic, they're not interested. It's a cheap substitute. I've been trying to show you, you should go for the cheap substitute. It's pretty good. <laughs> so the conclusions are this. Whoops, don't want to do that. This. Absolute free will. What Jerry Fodor wants isn't worth wanting, actually. You don't need it. The kinds worth wanting are those that give us moral responsibility. These are evolved competences for moral reasoning and decision making. These competences are exercised in opportunities. Deterministic opportunities are as real as opportunities could be. We can do otherwise in the sense that matters for morality. Free will in the sense that matters is compatible with determinism. So a notion of punishment that looks both backward and forward is what we're looking for. It depends not on cosmic desert, but on perceived fairness. If we perceive that the system is fair, we will take responsibility in order to have the opportunities of political freedom. In order to be free, the fish says, I had to make certain adjustments. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. That was wonderful. So we'll take a few questions. First question. Uh, no. Very simple question. Uh, early on, you, um, re you strongly recommended a book when you were talking about evitability the first time, but I didn't catch which book it was, please. Oh, I'm, deli I'm delighted to answer that question. It is called The Omnivore's Dilemma, and it's by Pollan, Michael P-O-L-L-A-N. Let me have got Andy Clark here, please. <coughs> Go further down. Hi. Thanks, Dan. So I guess I, I wasn't quite sure how individual learning was trading off here against something like achieved complexity in general. So, you know, the beings that have a big space of the evitable, it looks like they don't have to actually be learners. Uh, and oh. so would moral responsibility actually get a grip in a world where there was just lots of evitability but no learning? Mm. Good. Um, I'm really glad you asked, Andy, because that, that was a big complexification that I left out. First, and I think you would agree with this, the 
the line between learning and evolution is not principled. And uh, we can, after all, if we look around us, we see species that, as it were, hit the ground running, quite literally, and others like us that have long, helpless childhoods, and we do a lot of learning. We have to learn to walk and stand up and all that, whereas other animals don't. Now, in principle, I think, let's be silly for a moment, we could be born speaking English and being able to do long division and, and uh, 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 cost-benefit analysis in our heads. That doesn't happen to be true yet. And since, let's take for a moment cost-benefit analysis, since that sort of know-how is a big part, formally or informally, of the sort of evitability that we're capable of, at, at the moment, our capacity to learn and to learn indefinitely is a very significant part of the of, of moral free will. And for instance, I didn't get into this, but um, our chimpanzees don't have free will. Not the way we do. And the reason they don't is that there is a really clear and apparently unmovable horizon on their capacity to produce future and to learn. And there isn't for us. What is remarkable about us is our capacity to take everything we do and reflect on it, and then reflect on the reflections and reflect on the... By the way, a, a really good book on this, it's just a new book, uh, is Doug Hofstadter's I Am a Strange Loop, which uh, there's my second book recommendation of the night, I Am a Strange Loop by Doug Hofstadter. Okay, good. We've got a question over here. I was thinking of creatures like foxes, fish, flies. They're avoiders. They're pretty good avoiders, of course. And they're evolved avoiders. Yep. But I think from what you've just said, you don't want to say that they're, they're, they're agents or have free will in the same sense as we have. I would say they're agents, but they're not free agents. Uh, Motor proteins are agents, cells are agents of sorts, amoebas are agents. And, and it's not a, it's not a, a, a cut and dried, uh, on off, yes, no thing. Our, there is an evolution of agency and uh, I think it's simply undeniable that adult, normal adult human beings are by any reasonable measure just like orders of magnitude uh, more uh, responsible agents than any other species on the planet. That may change someday. But, but uh, yes, they're avoiders, but that's, that's a necessary condition. All I wanted to do today is establish some necessary conditions for free will. And the most obvious necessary condition that people have argued about is, is they thought that the determinism had to be false. And I wanted to show, no, at least on that issue, we can, if we can get avoidance without uh, without indeterminism, then, then we can carry on from there. Right, we have a question here. It seems to me that uh, I am consciously uttering these words. To I'm me quite too. prepared to accept, however, that uh, I'm not so conscious because uh, uh, my consciousness takes far too long to uh, so that I am uttering these words unconsciously. And clearly, if I claim that I am uh, speaking them consciously, that is a fiction. I am, however, conscious of hearing my words. That is uh, an event which takes place sometime after Now, in your account of consciousness, you would claim that my report, my, rep uh, my report uh, of this uh, consciousness of hearing my words, it would be a fiction. But uh, surely, um, it, it can only be a fiction in a very different sense than this report of an event which never took place. 
And uh, going on from that, could I suggest that you've got a lot more uh, work to do to dispel uh, this real magic of consciousness uh, in that uh, the, uh, we just do not exploit the richness of consciousness in reports or behavior, but for instance, um, I am visually conscious of your right eye, uh, but um, that is just one of a myriad of uh, things that I am conscious of, uh, but it's only that one I've reported, which you would say was a fiction. I would say, what would I say is a fiction? Uh, would you not say that uh, my report of my visual experience was a fiction? No. Oh. I understood from your book that you did. So I think we'll, move, we'll, we'll move on to um, another one. Let, uh, but let me just say one. Um, uh, my first book on free will was called Elbow Room, and in it, there was a sentence that was the most important sentence in the book, and I very stupidly put it in parentheses. It was, if you make yourself really small, you can externalize virtually everything. I meant it as a sort of joke. The point is, if you think of yourself as punk paste, you make lots of problems for your theory. You have to recognize that yourself is larger than that. And your conscious self is larger than just uh, what, what your uh, opening remarks about, about uh, uh, what you're saying uh, 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 suggested. Um, indeed, it's rare that we know what we're going to say before we say it. We hear what we're going to say at the same time that our audience hears what we're going to say. So it's a mistake to think that we consciously construct our sentences and, and then utter them. But that we are consciously speaking does not require that bad model of utterance because the self is more than just what we are currently conscious of. By the way, there's a, there's a lovely um, semi-technical term for that moment when we hear ourselves saying something and regret what we're saying. <laughs> It's known as an Ono second. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That was lovely. Right, we've got a question here at the front. Much as I enjoyed your lecture, I have to say that you haven't convinced me that free will is anything other than an illusion, perhaps a flattering illusion. If we go back to your example of the brick being projected at your head, you were saying rightly that most people would duck, but some people might not. And in your description of those who might not, you prefaced it by saying, suppose you're hard up. Suppose you want to get money from a lawsuit. Uh, and suppose you believe that would be successful, etc. In other words, you were postulating situations that existed in advance, which helped to explain the decision that is made. Now, one might argue that if only one knew enough about what had gone before, one could fully explain decisions that are made, even predict decisions that are, that are going to be made. In other words, argue that everything is determined, although uh, there is the illusion that we make a decision whether to avoid the brick or not. I'm so glad you asked that question because I neglected to underline something which I realized from what you've just said I really should have said. I'm saying that our smallest parts are determined and we're determined. I'm not saying that when you go to the higher level you escape the bounds of determinism. So I agree, yes, in principle, the Laplacian demon with perfect knowledge could know exactly who was going to duck the brick and who wasn't. And I'm saying that's simply irrelevant to whether you have free will in the morally relevant sense. So I'm not saying that by going up to fancier, higher, more complex levels, we somehow create something which is undetermined. 
I'm saying that nevertheless, we create something in that way. Those chess programs, it's all determined. And if they were not chess programs, but, but moral decision makers, they would still be determined, but they might have free will. But that just seems to me like very complex determinism. It is complex determinism. <laughs> That's what compatibilism is. It says the idea that determinism and free will are incompatible, that's the mistake. They're not incompatible. They're not incompatible. That was, that's what I was trying to show. I, I'm now going to, ha I'm afraid, have to give the vote of thanks for that uh, brilliant lecture. We, we've run a bit over time. Um, it was an absolutely superb lecture. All the, we can see it in all the eager potential questions that are there, and in the fact that inevitably there will be debate and argument <laughs> afterwards. Um, philosophy, like mathematics, makes all sorts of claims for its domain, and they were superbly made here, and implicitly and explicitly. We had you know, physics and biology were taken as subsets of this important enterprise. Um, lots of nice references uh, were given. Um, I think the thing that it is particularly compelling, so, is we were dealing with, Dan presented this with a really serious issue that people have been arguing about for a long time, and he related it to a very important social issue as he started, you know, exactly what is our view about punishment, exactly how do we, might we treat people. So it's a, an argument that as well as being very important, obviously has serious consequences, for me, there were three particular aspects of, of the lecture which I found uh, tremendously attractive. One was the absolute clarity and the, the lovely rhetorical tricks where you <laughs> tricked us. You seemed to be going one way and suddenly turned. But that was, I mean, in terms of public speaking, absolutely beautiful, very, very clear and such dramatic changes in direction that you held our attention. The second was, and we can see it in how gruntled the audience is, the superb use of etymology, <laughs> uh, which is something I really like, the way you used etymological devices to move it along. Um, but the final thing, in addition to the clarity and the etymology, which I just found, found absolutely wonderful, uh, was the uh, incredible use of humour. I mean, it was like, you know, it is hard to think that one could have an hour and a half on free will and determinism with that much laughter. <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in thanking Dan. Thank you. Thank you very much.